Radio for Readers Bookmark. We're back with Heidi Cullen. Many of you know her from her years at the Weather Channel. She has been uh, gone from the Weather Channel for a short time, but you still probably uh, see her with... Uh, weather information on the the nightly news hour with jim lair occasionally and she's written a book called the weather of the future she joins us live here at the bookmark program today on wndb heidi Collin, good seeing you good to see you too mark all right the weather of the future the first thing that comes to mind is permanent changes i mean this year florida in particular heidi did not get the hurricanes that we thought with nine to twelve they were talking about of which five could have been severe i was talking with uh meteorologist lou mcnally who's on staff at Embry Riddle, and he was saying, "Well, we have this uh, La Nina that was coming. Keep, was that what was keeping exactly. things going?" Exactly. Well, the La. Ni- well, interestingly enough, the forecast for this season was it. It ended up being a, uh, an above average. It was an active season, but just because of the location of the Bermuda High, we just all the storms. Lucky for us, you know, stayed away from the coast for the most part. But La Nina is actually one of these phenomenon that reduces wind shear. So generally speaking, when we have a La Nina, we actually expect an above average hurricane season. Wow. So we have total opposites here. Yeah. Well, like I said, it was an above average season, but, you know, we got lucky. So things didn't didn't hit land. Thank right. goodness. The weather of the future. What's it going to be like? Let's well, take us to the short term. Yeah, well, and that that really was the point of the book, was to kind of take this huge topic of of climate change and global warming and just bring it home and help people connect the dots to how climate sort of works its way into our weather. You know, and it's it's one of these phenomena where climate change technically, it's a 1.3 degree increase in the global average temperature, but climate ends up increasing the amount and the intensity of extreme events. So we've already, from the observational record, begun to see an increase in in heat waves. Rainfall, storms are becoming more intense. And so I think the easiest way to think about climate change is more extreme weather. I've been recently introduced to the subject of forensic weather. Yes. Which uh, explains how historic things have happened, and uh, it's tremendously useful. I understand there's a whole industry now to do forensic weather for insurance companies. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it's really fascinating. And I'll tell you, there's actually a climate change connection there in the sense that one of one of the points of the book is is to help folks think about doing a weather autopsy. And the best example that we have right now of a weather autopsy was the European heat wave of 2003. Some time, some scientists from the UK Met Office actually took the European heat wave of 2003, you know, record, record heat, you know, warmest summer in over 500 years. It was considered a one in a thousand year event. Climate scientists basically modeled the European heat wave to ask the question, to what extent did global warming increase the odds of the European heat wave hap- happening. So it's kind of like trying to do an autopsy on that event in the same way that you would try to understand to what extent smoking increases the risk of lung cancer. And what they found was that global warming actually doubled or possibly quadrupled the chances of that heat wave happening. And what becomes really interesting then is that if you fast forward out in time, by the middle of the century, the European heat wave is happening roughly every other year, and by the end of the century, the European heat wave of 2003 is considered to be a relatively cool summer. So that's the kind of thought experiment you need to do. Do you believe in this global warming stuff? I do. I do. do? I, I sincerely believe that it's it's not really rocket science. That's the thing. And, and one of the things that I try to help people see is that it's actually an old problem. You know, scientists worked on it in the 17 and 1800s, actually. But see, here's the problem we're going to have. My listeners are hearing this and they're saying, yeah, this is nonsense. They say we have global warming, then we have the coolest summer we've had on record. or You know what I mean? Yes. Well, th- Thank you for asking that question yeah. because I think it, it's perfectly natural and it, it, it shows up in the polling as well that if we have a cold winter, you know, people's people's belief in global warming drops. And for me, this past winter was so fascinating. I live in the Northeast, I love snowstorms. And I think the really important thing to remember is that if you think of climate as this orchestra, we have tons of natural climate variability. We just talked about La Nina. You've got El Nino and La Nina working on three to seven year time scales. You've got things like the Madden-Julian Oscillation and the North Atlantic Oscillation, which this past winter happened to be very negative, brings lots of cold Arctic air into the Northeast. And so 
Natural climate variability will always be there, but you've got this steady drumbeat of warming in the background. Talking with Heidi Cullen, many of you remember her for her work on the Weather Channel. Probably see her now on the Jim Lair uh, nightly news program. I just learned this week, Heidi, that volcanoes and their eruptions can actually affect weather. Absolutely. And then we've had this thing where the planet cooled by one degree because of some huge volcano, maybe Indonesia, something like that. Yeah. Do you speak to that in the book? Yes, and in, it's really interesting in the sense that um, volcanic eruptions were actually used to help test the models. In fact, Jim Hansen was, was one of the first to use a volcanic eruption to do what he, you would call a hindcast, where he actually took that eruption, erupted it in a climate model, and then predicted how much the Earth would cool. And you know, as as you just said, you know, major volcanic eruption. If if the junk gets far enough into the stratosphere, it will it will have a short lived cooling effect. Okay, let's talk a little bit about background. Your degrees. Where'd you go to school, and what degrees do you hold? Um, I went to Columbia and I studied engineering. I actually studied operations research and worked on uh, Wall Street for a year. And which I have to say, there's a lot of connections when you look at just I never time series this. data. You yeah, worked on Wall Street for you. Yeah, I, I I did, and you know, like I said, I think there's a lot of interesting connections when you look at time series data, whether it's you know stock performance, where you can think of like day trading as weather, and then sort of the long term yeah. economic growth trend as climate. And you know, I just I I guess I I sort of was always fascinated by oceanography and and climate and just decided to go back I ended up getting a PhD in ocean atmospheric dynamics and I'll tell you my my PhD really focused on natural climate variability and trying to understand the dynamics of these sort of large scale oscillations within so you're a doctor, the planet I, yes <laughs> and there, we see this is it graduate meteorological there's a small symbol in the right hand corner of a television when a person who is degreed is on. It makes them different than a weather person. Yeah, there's an AMS seal. Thank you. And you have the AMS. Well, I'm not a meteorologist per se. I mean, I love meteorology and I love well, the five-day forecast. But yeah. no, I, I, you know, I don't have. I'm, I'm just, I'm a classic research scientist. Is, is my training. So I, I, I was lucky enough to work with operational weather forecasters, and I love what they do. But uh, so they would set it up, and you would deliver information. Well, basically? you know, when I was at the Weather Channel, I really focused on sort of the the large scale climate, and so we we. We kind of picked up where the forecasters left off, where we could give, um, there's a climate prediction center um, through NOAA, where they offer month, three-month seasonal outlooks. Um, we, you know, we did drought outlooks. And then, you know, you can kind of think of climate change, this sort of okay. long-term warming trend is the mother of it all. I grew up in New England and uh, left there about 20 years ago. So I grew up in Rhode Island, and we would go through these spells, and then they got clobbered with snow, incredible winters. Uh, and hot summers. In Florida, we're having another drought. It reminds me of 1998, when we had such a bad drought that we had fires. It's La Nina. Well, I mean, in 98 really? was another La Nina year. Um, and basically, the, the fingerprint of La Nina in the U.S. is a warmer, drier southern tier of the U.S. It's actually, you know, for skiers, uh, Pacific Northwest tends to see a nice snowfall season. So we tend to see rainier or, or snowier, cooler weather in the Pacific Northwest, but the southern tier. In fact, Lake Mead, um, a lot of folks are worried because it just hit an all-time record low. We know it's a La Nina year, so we know that uh, there's a good chance that they won't be seeing a whole lot of rain this come. This, they, say this you can, they say you can only believe a percentage of what's on the internet. There's a story that I read that said that um, they actually have a device that can control weather. Is that true? Huh. It can affect the weather. What kind of device is this? It's some kind of a device that's out there. You have you're not aware of this. I well, I'm not I've, saying it's true, but you. Have you I heard have. This story? I mean, I've I've heard of. I mean, there's cloud seeding, and I've heard of. I've heard of certain devices that can try to impact the local sort of microclimate, whether like through bringing cold air or moisture in from other places. So I, yeah, I've I've heard about different things, but I'm not exactly sure which one you're talking about. Do you think that we'll ever be able to fend off hurricanes somehow? You know, it's it's funny. I and you know maybe this relates to the device you were talking about. I I have talked to some folks who have, you know, come up with with theories for how we might be able to do it. But you know, basically the the thinking is is that hurricanes are just so powerful that it would be really really difficult 
I'd, I'd sell them for them. fending off tornadoes. Yeah. Those, to me, are the most unforgiving systems of all. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing about, you know, I, I, for me, like, weather forecasts are, they're just amazing in the sense that they are our, at this point, our, our biggest chance to just protect ourselves in advance. Heidi, the best thing that we have going for us now is the detection ability is so much more superior than it was 50 years ago, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because I was just talking to, to Dr. Greg Forbes about this, the, the tornado expert at the Weather Channel. And, you know, it's interesting because one of the whole research objectives is to increase the lead time in terms of tornado forecasts. But what's been interesting is that if you, even if you give people five minutes more in terms of, of warnings, we we don't necessarily capitalize on that time. So there there's there's sort of a component of just the research angle, but then also just what do we do with the extra time, and and how do we how do we respond to the forecasts and and make Good use question. of it? Will the weather of the future dictate more and more how we build? Gosh, I hope so. I mean, I I'm a just I'm a strong believer in the fact that we need to make infrastructure upgrades. I mean, we, you know. Our country has really not made any serious sort of transportation and electricity upgrades in 50 years or so. And when you think about adding additional heat to the atmosphere and increasing the number of extreme weather events, infrastructure is just one of the smartest things you can focus on. And it's interesting because I've been talking a lot with the um, emergency management community. In fact, folks in Miami are really trying to work with the emergency management community to integrate long-range planning infrastructure upgrades with just, you know, dealing with extreme weather events. And if you can merge climate change adaptation with extreme weather emergency management, it it protects you in the long run. And one of the big statistics that I've, I've seen used frequently, which is for every $1 you invest now in you know, investing in your infrastructure, adapting to future climate, you save $4 in the long run because you it's just so much cheaper to do this kind of stuff up front. Does it make sense to move more towards solar? I think that we really seriously need to diversify our energy portfolio. I mean, we need we need to, to look at our country where you know there's there's a wind belt in the same way you know that there's a tor- there's tornado alley and there's there's a, a a region of the coast that's really vulnerable to hurricanes. We've got a wind belt that stretches from Texas to Montana. We've got you know this this south the southwestern portion of the US where there's tremendous solar capacity. I think we have to sort of look at our country's natural assets and and really think about ways to upgrade our energy grid and diversify our energy portfolio. I think of those countries that are in the far north in Europe where they don't get a lot of sun. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like operating with one hand behind your back. I mean, what do those people do? Well, you know what's so crazy is that a lot of times people will point to Germany. And if you just look at the amount of incoming they have a lot so- of solar, they have a lot of solar, but they don't get very much sun. So it just goes to show you that, you know, you can still capitalize on the resource. Um, and, you know, compared to the U.S. Southwest, where we've got tremendous sun potential. You know, I, I just think it, it makes a lot of sense to just capitalize on these natural assets. Heidi, does the ozone layer replenish itself at any point? Well, the, the ozone hole, if you're talking about stratospheric Can ozone, it, it, it is healing itself. I mean, I think the forecast right now is that within the next 60 years or so, given that we continue to, you know, monitor and, and just reduce our CFCs, it should it should it should be healed roughly within 60 years it's showing signs of healing now so so yes it it, it the, the ozone hole is sort of beginning to to fill in because without it the planet will heat up yes well the the ozone hole is well the ozone the protective ozone layer is is what yeah protects us from from ultraviolet radiation so it, it's it's very much a, a protective layer you're a very light-skinned person. Do you take seriously the worry about the sun and what it can do to your skin, to your eyes, all of that? I I do. I've got, as my dad says, I've got cheap Irish skin, you know, and, and we really need to, 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 to be careful about that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I definitely, definitely try to do my best to be when, careful. When it, there was, not to go political on you, but when this story came out about cap and trade or cap and taxes, it's known... A big part of it was to sort of reduce our carbon emissions, the carbon footprint, if I'm not mistaken, because that would affect weather as well. 
But countries, emerging countries like India and China, were to be excluded. And for that, I was opposed to the measure because I was saying, how can we take over 2 billion people and say somehow they don't factor in? And it had to be politics. Do you have a thought on that? I mean, could we have an effective emissions program without including China and India in it? Well, you know, I think that's why a lot of people will say that, that climate change is it's the mother of all problems. I mean, it, 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 it gets to our energy infrastructure. It gets to our, you know, how, how we utilize and, and grow our economy. And it's the ultimate international problem. Now, here in the U.S., I mean, I think basically we've got you know, three different approaches to take. There's adaptation, just infrastructure upgrades, planning for the fact that, you know, if we continue to emit greenhouse gases, we're going to have to deal with more extreme storms. Mitigation, cutting greenhouse gases, which energy efficiency in and of itself is is pretty easy. What's the takeaway from the Weather of the Future book? You know, I, I think the takeaway is really meant to help people see how climate change is is playing out within our weather right now, and then sort of helping helping folks fast forward through time to help folks see what climate change will look like right here, um, right you know right in our own backyards if if we don't you know if we don't do anything about it. So it's just a way to help people see climate and see how climate works its way into our weather. Okay, finally. Heidi Cullen leaves the Weather Channel two years ago and does what? Uh, I helped start up a nonprofit science journalism organization. So I work um, at a place called Climate Central, which you can kind of think of us as a nonprofit media organization whose sole beat is climate and climate change. Where's it based? Uh, we're based in Princeton, New Jersey, and also in Palo Alto, California. Do you and do you feed universities around the country, or are you consider a think tank for the private sector? Uh, we we basically produce um, graphics and videos and print articles. I mean, we're think of us kind of like the Center for Investigative Journalism, but we focus strictly on climate. We're a science journalism shop that basically provides content. We also offer up free B-roll for folks who want to tell stories about climate change but can't afford. To. Have you ever been one of those hurricane chasing nuts or tornado chasing nuts? I am nuts? a total weather weenie. I, I, you know, I've never been tornado chasing, but I would love to go out. What is it? About I don't know. It's I mean, just it's, like it's saying, Mother Nature me, at its most extreme. It, yeah, I mean, there's just something have, about it. Have you seen a tornado up close? No, I've only seen video. And in fact, you know, I, I would. There was you know, this storm that came through New York a couple of weeks ago, and somebody actually just took a YouTube video of, of literally, you could sort of see it coming through Brooklyn. It was amazing. I got one for you. I lived and worked in Providence. I worked for the Providence Journal. And one day, I was coming back to the Providence Journal. I was on 195 that comes through the city. It's divided. The Providence River goes through it. And there was an actual funnel cloud. Oh, my goodness. Big one. In the downtown, I, I said, well, I'm also looking around because there's no way I'm going to escape this. I'm dead. <laughs> and it, it, almost as quickly as it hit, it dispersed. It hit two roofs, took off the tar paper and, uh, and shingles. And then as it moved toward the river, it broke up. It what didn't even stay as one of those little um, twisters you see off of the yeah. ocean. It just dissipated. But for, for just about 8 to 10 seconds, there was a formed dark cloud spinning. I'd never seen anything like that in that part of the country. Um, they say the closest yeah, would be really Western rare. Massachusetts, yeah. Western Massachusetts, um, but I have seen them in Florida, and they are scary. Yeah. I have no desire to be anywhere near them. Yeah. So, congratulations on the book. This is your first book? Yeah, it is my first book. Thank you so much. And I, I wish you luck, and, and thanks so much for visiting with us. Heidi Cullen. Thanks for having me. Our guest today on the Bookmark Program.